Okay, here you are, in the middle of the ocean. It's endless, but you can't see it, because there's a thick fog all around you. Dense clouds hide the huge but dim sun. Is it day or night? You don't know. There's only a gray haze around you. You're alone. Even if you try to swim down, after several hours, you still won't be able to see the bottom of the ocean. And that's a typical water planet for you. I know, sounded kind of dark, but it's not that bad. These water worlds are more interesting than they may seem, so let's take a look at them. The ocean planet is a planet that consists, as you might have guessed, mainly of water, ice, and maybe some rocks. Think of the Earth's oceans. Its horrifying depths, the Mariana Trench, and all that. And now, can you guess how much space all the water on Earth takes up? 0.025%, exactly. Now, just try to imagine a world of 40 to 60% water. If you dive in there, the depth can exceed 60 miles. Compared to that, the 6 mile depth of our Mariana Trench sounds like nothing. And yeah, the pressure there will be enormous. It can reach up to 20,000 Earth atmospheres. Very crushing. Now, it may sound scary, but it still would be great to find out more about these planets. Fortunately, according to scientists' calculations, there may be a lot of such planets in our galaxy alone. Well, you don't have to go far. You can find these water guys even in our solar system. Not planets, of course, but moons. Jupiter has Ganymede and Callisto, and Saturn has Titan and Enceladus. The ocean can reach up to 30% of the mass of these moons, although it isn't clear whether these oceans are covered with a thick crust of ice. But we've discovered quite a few full-fledged ocean planets. This is because the conditions in which these planets may exist are very specific. For example, this planet should be somewhere 6 to 8 times larger than the Earth. If it's smaller, it'll have a rocky surface. But if it's bigger, it'll turn into a gas giant. At the same time, it must be in the habitable zone of its star. A little further, and the planet immediately turns into an icy giant or a cold super-Earth. So yeah, these guys are very picky. We first started exploring these planets back in the 1970s. However, since then, we've found only a couple of them. But they're still very interesting. The first planet is Gliese 1214b. It was the very first ocean planet that we discovered. Initially, the scientists noticed only a small dim dot. This dot turned out to be the red dwarf star Gliese 1214, an unremarkable, completely ordinary star that's five times smaller than our Sun and 300 times dimmer. Scientists wouldn't worry about it at all, but back in 2009, they noticed that this star had one single planet. And this planet turned out to be quite strange. This super-Earth was 2.5 times bigger than our Earth and 6.5 times heavier. But at the same time, it had a very, very small density and about the same gravity as our planet. In other words, there were almost no rocks and metals on it. But it wasn't a gas giant either. So there was only one option left. It was covered in water and ice. And that's how we discovered the first ocean planet. Well, actually, we can only assume that it consists of water. That's what the mathematical calculations say. In reality, this planet is quite confusing. It's difficult to explore, and so far, scientists haven't been able to find anything there. No hydrogen, no helium, no water, nada. That's because the outer layer of the atmosphere of this planet is very dense, and it perfectly hides its composition. But even so, it's probably a water world. Gliese 1214b is very close to its star. It's only 0.014 astronomical units away, which is less than the distance between the Moon and us. The year there lasts about 36 hours, and the temperatures, to put it mildly, are just wild. Scientists suggest that the average temperature there can reach 250 to 535 degrees Fahrenheit. Woo, that's hot! Remember the creepy description from the beginning? Well, actually, Spending time on Gliese 1214b would be a little different, more like swimming in a steam boiler. Because of such gigantic temperatures, the ocean on the surface will be constantly in a state close to boiling without actually reaching it. So, imagine that you're descending to the surface of this planet, flying through clouds of steam, and then you suddenly find yourself in the water. What? But when did it happen? 
Well, that's because the boundary between steam and water on Gleesey 1214B will be very blurred. Of course, you won't be able to swim to the bottom of this ocean. But most likely, this bottom is covered with a very thick layer of so-called hot ice. It's like regular ice, but it doesn't really care about the laws of physics, so it just doesn't melt even at gigantic temperatures. And the thickness of this ice can reach as much as 3,000 miles. So that's it for the creepy Gleesey 1214B. And not an Airbnb in sight. Now although we can't 100% guarantee that it's a water world, we still have another candidate for this position. A newly discovered planet called TOI 1452b. This planet, located in the Dragon constellation, is almost 100 light years away from us. It was discovered using the TESS telescope by a group of researchers from the University of Montreal. This planet also belongs to the class of super Earths. It's seven times larger than our planet, but 48 times heavier. Again, all this is at a very low density. Because of this, scientists have suggested that almost the entire planet consists of a giant ocean. Here, we were a little luckier. This world won't be just a giant puddle in some thick ice. On this planet, there's probably a rocky surface deep under the water, just like in a typical ocean. Don't get too excited, though. This ocean will certainly be very different from what we're used to. TOI 1452b also orbits a small red dwarf. And not even one, but two at once. At the same time, if the previous planet was close to its sun, then this one, on the contrary, is very, very far away. It's two and a half times farther from its stars than Pluto is from the sun. And it moves at great speed. A year there lasts only 11 days. But we still don't know many things about this planet. We'll probably get some new information when scientists observe it from the James Webb Telescope. Well, that's it. Wait, did you expect something else? Alright, alright, I know the question that bothers you the most. Can there be life? Well, this is a difficult question. We all know that water means life, and besides, these planets are in the habitable zones of their stars. So, potentially, yes, there might be life. Not some full-fledged civilizations, of course, but bacteria, fish, and some creepy giant monsters. I mean, you know, why not? However, this is very unlikely. Water alone isn't enough to create life, even though it's very important. There should also be some microelements and some minerals. And unfortunately, for most water planets, the composition will only consist of water and very thick ice. There won't be any minerals there. But don't give up. There's still some probability. First of all, there are meteorites and comets. They can bring the necessary minerals to the planet. The more often they crash into it, the higher the probability that they'll bring something like this into the ocean and thus create life. Secondly, TOI 1452b actually has these minerals. Yes, we don't know how deep the rocky bottom is located there. But if it exists, then surely something could have originated there. Let's hope that new research with powerful telescopes will allow us to find out the truth. And who knows? Maybe one day we'll be able to visit such a planet ourselves. How do people usually describe planets? Massive, freezing, boiling hot, seismically active. Let's admit it, shiny is not normally on the list. Unless we're talking about a world called LTT 9779b which might be the shiniest planet we've ever seen. This exoplanet, which is basically any planet outside our solar system, is ultra-hot and acts like a giant space mirror because it's covered with a thick layer of reflective metallic clouds. This unusual world is located about 264 light-years away from our planet, and the most amazing thing about it is that it reflects approximately 80% of all the light its parent star sends its way. For comparison, Earth reflects a mere 30% of the light it gets from the Sun. The bizarre exoplanet is even more reflective than the shiniest planet in the solar system, Venus, which reflects around 75% of sunlight due to its thick clouds. LTT 9779b is five times as large as Earth, which makes it the largest space mirror ever discovered. 
By the way, this world was found by NASA's Transiting Exoplanet Survey satellite mission in 2020. But the highly reflective nature of the planet was uncovered later thanks to a follow-up investigation conducted by the European Space Agency Exoplanet Hunting Spacecraft, CHEOPS, which stands for Characterizing Exoplanet Satellite. Now, imagine a planet the size of our ice giant, Neptune. It's a burning world floating close to its star. If you stepped on its surface and looked up, you'd see heavy clouds of metals floating over your head, raining down titanium droplets. The planet's size, coupled with its insane temperatures, allow astronomers to classify the planet as an ultra-hot Neptune. Now, a planet's high reflectivity is a quality known as albedo. And in the case of our shiny world, it's albedo mystifies scientists. All because most planets that are not ice worlds or planets with thick layers of reflective clouds, like Venus, normally have low albedos. Their atmosphere or surfaces simply absorb the light coming from their stars, preventing it from getting reflected back into space. And initially, researchers were sure that LT9779b would have a low albedo. After that, by no means was it an ice world. Not with the surface temperatures reaching 3,650 degrees Fahrenheit on the side of the planet permanently facing its parent star. It was supposed to be too hot for water clouds to form. Even clouds of metal or glass wouldn't be able to form in such a scorching climate. Astronomers expected a planet like that to have its atmosphere destroyed by its star, which would leave behind a lifeless, rocky world. That's why discovering metallic clouds was so unexpected. Of course, researchers were eager to find out how such clouds could have formed. It had remained a mystery until they decided to think about the cloud formation in the same way as condensation that appears in the bathroom after you take a hot shower. There are two ways to steam up your bathroom. You can cool the air until the water vapor condenses, or you can keep hot water running until clouds form. It will happen when the air in the bathroom becomes so saturated with vapor that it won't be able to hold it anymore. So, researchers came to the conclusion that most likely the atmosphere of the shiny planet became oversaturated with silicate at one point. And then, metal started vaporizing due to boiling hot temperatures on the permanent day side of the planet. But if you think that the reflective nature of LT9779b is its only unusual feature, you might want to hear this. The exoplanet is an example of an extremely rare planetary type, and ultra-hot Neptune. Astronomers have been searching for such planets for decades, but those preferred to remain a mystery. The fact that the planet survived so close to its star might be linked to its high reflectivity. Some experts believe that the metal clouds covering the planet probably reflect light and prevent the planet from overheating and evaporating. Plus, such a highly metallic atmosphere is much heavier and harder to blow away than any other. Now, about 850 light years away from Earth, a planet called WASP 121b orbits its star. This planet is a hot Jupiter which means it's a gas giant moving very close to its star. And because of such a short distance, the planet is also insanely hot. The average day temperature there is around 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Interestingly, just like our previous shiny world, this planet also has metallic clouds floating over its surface. But that's not the only oddity. WASP-121b has a bizarre oblong shape. Can it be because the planet is tidally locked to its star? It means that one of its sides always faces the star, while the other is always turned to the darkness of the cosmos. In other words, it's always daytime on one side of the planet and nighttime on the other, which causes crazy temperature differences. Researchers think it might be the reason for the metallic clouds. 
The water cycle on WASP-121B is also pretty bizarre, to say the least. On the illuminated side, the atoms that make up the planet's water get ripped apart by the insane temperatures. After that, they get blown by winds moving at 11,000 miles per hour to the other side of the planet. There, much lower temperatures allow the atom to recombine into water molecules. At the same time, the nighttime side is cold enough for metal clouds consisting of iron and corundum to form. When these clouds migrate to the daytime side of the planet, they vaporize and rain down metal on the planet's surface. But if these clouds don't seem impressive enough, I've got more. Astronomers predict that the planet will rip itself apart in the next several million years because of its incredibly fast winds and wild temperatures. Plus, the gravitational pull of the planet's parent star also plays its role in this dark prediction. Since WASP-121b is so close to the star, the star's gravity pulls the planet into a weird oblong shape and makes gases like iron and magnesium leak from the planet's atmosphere. This pull is so strong that the planet is always on the verge of a tidal disruption. If it ever happens, the planet will come apart for good, metallic clouds and all. Just 20 light years away from the sun, which isn't such a great distance when we talk about space, a bizarre rogue planet is roaming our home Milky Way galaxy. But even though this planet doesn't orbit any star, it still has an incredibly powerful magnetic field. It's 4 million times stronger than Earth's magnetic field. The exoplanet also produces amazing auroras. When it was discovered in 2016, astronomers were almost sure they had detected a brown dwarf which is an object too large to be a planet and too small to be a star. But later, scientists got some proof that the space object wasn't big enough to be a brown dwarf. The planet sure is a mammoth among its peers. It's 1.2 times as wide as the largest planet of the solar system, Jupiter, and more than 12 times as heavy. Astronomers think the exceptionally strong magnetic field helps the planet produce the auroras. But the most curious thing is that they're generated in a different way than auroras on Earth. It might be because the exoplanet's moon helps the planet create these light shows. Another planet you probably shouldn't set foot on is WASP-76b. There, it rains iron on the night side of the planet. And the temperature on the daytime side rises up to 4,300 degrees Fahrenheit that's hot enough to vaporize most metals. This exoplanet is a bit larger than Jupiter in terms of size and is located 640 light years away from Earth. Such terrifying weather conditions in this world are caused by its unusual orbit. The distance between the planet and its parent star is 10 times shorter than the distance between Mercury and the Sun. The only life that we are certain about so far in the entire universe is on planet Earth. Whether that life is intelligent is, let's say, arguable. But anyway, it's not surprising that we're tirelessly searching for life on other planets. So far, they've discovered more than 4,000 of them. But what's even cooler? NASA has compiled a new list of 24 planets that aren't just Earth-like, they're better. The conditions on them are so good that they're more comfortable than on our planet. So let's examine some of them. KOI 5715.01 Hmm, let's be coy, shall we? <laughs> this wonderful planet is in the constellation Cygnus. And why is it so wonderful? Well, our sun is a yellow dwarf. And sorry sun, even though you're not bad at supporting life, there are some stars that can do it better. Nothing personal. The planet Koi 5715.01 orbits near an orange dwarf. Orange dwarfs are stars slightly smaller than our sun and have a little lower luminosity. Uh, did you like the alliteration there? Anyway, don't worry, it doesn't mean we're going to live in complete darkness. In fact, if the planet is found closer to the sun and it has a thicker atmosphere, it may even be lighter and more colorful than on Earth. 
Now, our sun has a very short lifespan. Right now, it has 7 to 8 billion years left to live, a little longer than Earth's age. But orange dwarfs can live from 45 to 70 billion years. This is great not only because we'll be able to hang out on this planet longer, but also because the planets around these stars have more time to form life. Now, ideally, we would need to find a planet next to an orange dwarf that is about 7 billion years old. It's very likely there will be at least some organisms there. Koi 571501 is about 5.5 billion years old. Yeah, it may not seem mature enough, but that's okay, neither do I. Our Earth is a billion years younger, and that didn't stop us. The planet is quite close to its star and is in a habitable zone. One year there lasts 190 days. Imagine going to elementary school and already getting a driver's license. <laughs> it's almost two times larger than the Earth. The average temperature there is 52 degrees Fahrenheit, which is slightly less than ours, 57. But it mostly feels warmer there because strong gravity helps it hold on to heat in the atmosphere longer. It's a little too far away, though, like 3,000 light years from Earth which is about 18 quadrillion miles. Yep, better bring a really big lunch with you. Koi 3010.01 This planet is found next to the star Koi 2010. This planet sounds like a very pleasant world. The average temperature on this planet is 67 degrees, so a little warmer than ours. But that's a good thing. Scientists believe that on a perfect planet, the temperature should be just about 10 degrees hotter than on Earth. The more heat there is on the planet, the more comfortable it is to live there. Also, the higher chances of developing life. The radius of this planet is nearly one and a half times larger than Earth. There's some atmosphere, although we're not yet sure about its composition. But it's probably like the Earth's. Scientists think that we'll find an ocean there, and it can cover up to 60% of the surface, which is also cool. In a perfect world, water and land should be distributed more evenly than on our planet. A little more land means a little more territory and resources, right? But listen, this planet is actually very similar to the Earth. The semblance is so striking that scientists believe we have an 84% chance to find life there. Of course, not necessarily an intelligent life, but at least some animals. Wouldn't that be cool? Now, what do you think they could look like? Hmm very Earth-like planet, but with stronger gravity. Well, if someone lives there, they're probably big but have a small height and strong little legs. Sounds adorable and scary. But we won't be able to find out the truth anytime soon. So far, for us, these planets are microscopic dots in space. We only have some dry, boring data about them and don't even know what they look like. We'll have to wait until we can find a way to get closer to these planets. Kepler 186f. This is also one of the best candidates for having life. This rather cute planet was nicknamed the Earth's cousin because it does have a strong resemblance. Anyway, these two planets are like sisters, not twins. Kepler 186f rotates near a red dwarf. Red dwarfs are stars even dimmer and smaller than orange dwarfs. Yeah, they'll also live for a very, very long time. But their luminosity is also quite low. However, Kepler 186f is closer to its star than we're to our sun, so it shouldn't be too dark there. Well, at least not nightlike dark. The sky on this planet is sure to be an unusual shade of red, like sunsets on Earth. What do you think? Would you like to live on a planet with an eternal sunset? The size of this planet is about the same as Earth. Not bad, not perfect. Why so? Because the coolest planets are those that are bigger than Earth and have stronger gravity. Now you'll probably say, but wouldn't it be harder to walk there and even harder to get out of bed on Monday? <laughs> of course! But on the other hand, this planet will pull the atmosphere better. The atmosphere will be thicker and denser. This means more protection from the scary space stuff, more oxygen, and more heat. Not to mention the fact that the bigger planets have more space to settle. Awesome, right? But, of course, the Earth's size is also an excellent choice. Another cool fact is that the tilt of Kepler-186f is about the same as ours. It means that there should be stable seasons and a normal day-night cycle. Do you know how important the tilt of the planet is? Let's look at Mars. 
Mars is also, in fact, found in the habitable zone of our Sun. But its tilt is very unstable, and as a result, the entire ocean that could have been on it once now completely dried up. Today, it's just a red desert, and there's no life there. At least not as far as we know. But you see how important these tiny details are? This planet is also quite far away from us, 490 light years. It's about 3 quadrillion miles. So yeah, we're just going to keep waiting for intergalactic travel. Kepler 62e and 62f These planets were called the most Earth-like before we discovered Kepler 186f. They're very comparable to our home. Kepler 62e is about one and a half times larger than Earth, and Kepler 62f is just slightly smaller than that. They're located in the constellation Lyra, which is about 1,200 light years away from us. They both also orbit a red dwarf. One year on Kepler 62e lasts about 122 days, even less than on that first planet we talked about. Scientists believe that both 62e and 62f are sort of water worlds. Warm places mostly, or even completely covered with water. If there is land there, it's probably just some islands. Hmm, a world consisting entirely of islands. A fantasy dream for some, think Hawaii. And a nightmare for others, think Megalodon. But if you're a fan of ancient marine animals, just imagine how gigantic they could be there. Still, there are many things we don't know about this planet. Does it have a surface? What about its composition? Density? One day, maybe we'll be able to answer these questions. And so, that's it for the super-Earths. Of course, the original list is much longer, and you can go check it out on the internet. Now, the best thing about all this is that these are planets that are better than the Earth. But we also know thousands of other exoplanets that are just close enough to ours. And the odds are, a few of them have at least some form of life. But they're very, very far away, so we have no way to check it out right now. Perhaps, down the road, we'll find some cool creatures on many of them. Scientists keep finding new planets they call super-Earths. It's a class of more massive planets than Earth, but way lighter than ice giants, such as Uranus and Neptune. Super-Earths can be made of rock, gas, or a combination of these two. They are often twice or even up to 10 times bigger than the Earth. They're interesting to study, but kind of too far away from us. They're pretty common outside of our solar system, together with other interesting planets like mini Neptunes. Those can also be gas dwarfs, ice giants, or huge rocky bodies. But again, we don't have anything like that. But something we do have that those other solar systems don't? Jupiter. It's the biggest and heaviest object that orbits our sun. This king of planets possesses a powerful force to dominate our solar system. Jupiter is notorious for eating planets. A protoplanet slammed into it about 4.5 billion years ago, when Jupiter was still a young planet in its early stages. This protoplanet was 10 times heavier than Earth and was made of ice and rock. The collision was huge. Jupiter's core broke apart and helium and hydrogen mixed with denser materials. Through time, the heavy materials settled back into the dense core, which is what we see today. And if it swallowed a planet before, it might keep doing it as well. We suspect our solar system used to have many more large planets than it has now. For example, it's kind of empty around Mercury today. Similar areas around many other central stars are definitely more packed with intermediate mass planets with the size between Earth and Neptune. Our solar system was a chaotic place at its beginnings. Young stars were surrounded by swirling disks of dust and gas, and planets would form out of that debris, something like trees when they're springing up from the ground. Small rocky planets would form in the strong heat and light close to stars, while gas giants would form farther out, where temperatures were lower, which means they could preserve more gassy materials. And even though planets in our solar system seem pretty stable and peaceful today, following their orbit, they weren't that calm before. Some planets didn't have a circular orbit. They had oblong, more eccentric paths. It took them swinging first toward their stars and then farther away. It was like they had been thrown off kilter by the gravity of other planets on their way. 
There's something called the Grand Tack Theory. It explains things happening in the first few million years when our solar system was forming. At some point, Jupiter, one of the key players here, may have been pulled in closer by our central star. After that, it went back and took a huge cloud of debris. It was like a sailboat when it tacks around a buoy. This kind of messed with planets that were in the process of formation. After Saturn was fully formed, our close neighbors in the solar system cleared out a little. But if the idea about Grand Tack is correct, Jupiter had grabbed everything in its way, and its migrations had caused more collisions in this area. Jupiter might have delivered some of the water that now fills the oceans we have on our planet. It shepherds plenty of asteroids. From time to time, it sends some whizzing into interstellar space or amongst the planets in our solar system. It may have even taken part in the dinosaur extinction 66 million years ago. When the huge space rock hit the Earth, it left a crater off the coast of the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico. It all caused earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, and tsunamis that made a huge impact on all animal and plant life on Earth. No one knows where it came from. We're not even sure if it was an asteroid or a comet. One theory says it may have been a comet that came from the Oort cloud, which is made of icy debris and is located somewhere at the edge of our solar system. It could have been bumped off course by Jupiter and its powerful gravitational force. This way, our solar system was like a pinball machine, where Jupiter, the biggest planet, kicks incoming comets into orbits that send them closer to the Sun. When these comets are near the Sun, they can go through strong tidal forces that break them apart and eventually create shrapnel-like pieces of a comet. That event was a point when our mammalian ancestors started to rule. That means without Jupiter, there might not be us either, nor the Earth. It seemed like our biggest planet came swinging in, destroyed older planets, and cleared the way for smaller worlds like ours. Jupiter may have been the reason why we can't find Planet 9 right now. Scientists believe it exists, and they think it could be hiding somewhere beyond Neptune, but not Pluto. There are three zones in our solar system, the inner planets, outer planets, and whatever there is beyond. The mysterious planet could be the size of the Earth or Mars. It swirled among the gas giants before they eventually swept it toward the outer parts of our solar system, or even somewhere into deep space. Jupiter has stripes because of differences in temperature, atmospheric gas, and chemical composition. Scientists used to think the only reason for these different colors was the mighty atmospheric wind and material circulating between layers of the atmosphere. Now we know the light-colored stripes, or so-called zones, show us where the gas rises. When the stripes are dark-colored, they're called belts and can tell us where gas is sinking. Jupiter's moons could also be why the planet is stripy, because they're tugging on its atmospheric convection cells. At the center of Jupiter, there's a dense liquid core made of helium and metallic hydrogen, together with dissolved heavier elements. As we go further from its center, the temperature and pressure inside the planet drop off. That way, the liquid interior gives way to gases from the atmosphere. Again, mostly helium and hydrogen. No one knows how deep this liquid gas boundary lies, but the planet is probably fully liquid a couple of thousand miles under its cloud tops. Jupiter would still be bigger than some other giants, like Saturn, if we could strip its gases. Jupiter is sometimes even called a failed star, although that's not quite correct. It's mostly made of hydrogen, like regular stars, but it's still not massive enough to start thermonuclear reactions in its core, which would eventually turn it into a real star. In theory, every object could be turned into a star if you only add enough matter to it. If there's enough mass, the temperature and internal pressure will increase and start thermonuclear reactions. So, to turn Jupiter into a star, such as the Sun, you'd have to make it 1,000 times more massive. But to form a cooler red dwarf, you'd only need 80 Jupiter masses more. That way, Jupiter won't spontaneously become a new star of our solar system. But if many space objects with similar mass collide with it, or in other words, if Jupiter eats them, then maybe, <laughs> you never know. But in theory, if it could become a massive star, it would have stopped other planets from forming in stable orbits. It would have also increased the radiation that the surface of those planets get, which is why it would be really hard for life to develop in our solar system. 
Jupiter is the planet that spins the fastest in our solar system. It only needs 10 hours to make a full rotation on its axis. Even though it's huge, more than 300 times bigger than the Earth, and 2.5 times more massive than the rest of the planets in our entire solar system together. But if it got more massive, it would shrink. More mass would make Jupiter denser, which means it would begin pulling in on itself. So it could get four times its mass and would still be the same size. Extremely hot and insanely fast. <laughs> yeah, that's me. Oh wait, you mean the space thing. Okay, first, they discovered Peg 51, an exoplanet that orbits a star similar to ours. An exoplanet is any planet outside of our solar system that orbits a star that's not the Sun. This planet was completely different from anything we've ever found. Almost the same diameter as Jupiter, but half the gas giant's mass. It took only four days for this exoplanet to orbit its star, which seemed impossible. It was definitely too fast for something so massive. And then, scientists started finding something they've named hot Jupiters all over space. Lots of heated gas giants were located only a couple of million miles away from their stars. Sometimes, there were a couple of space bodies orbiting their stars pretty closely, and many were a few times bigger than Earth. Solar systems where they found hot Jupiters are not like ours. We have a neat system with smaller rocky planets on the inside and big gas giants on the outside. And almost all of them peacefully orbit the Sun, following their trajectories. Everything is in order. When a star is at the earliest stage of its formation, it creates a disk of gases, debris, and dust surrounding it. It's called an accretion disk. These gases slowly get pulled into the star because of its gravitational forces. And this leads to some kind of a stellar whirlpool. The outer parts of the disk are more gas-dense than the center. With time, the whirlpool effect gets even stronger. The same thing happens with hot Jupiters, which causes these gas giants to start orbiting much faster than usual. This also carries it further toward the star in a tightening spiral. Luckily, our Jupiter didn't become a hot Jupiter. Our gas giant started its life as an icy Earth-sized asteroid, which is different from the way hot Jupiters form. During the time when it was forming, Jupiter was around four times as far from the Sun as it is today, somewhere between Uranus and Neptune. About two to three million years after Jupiter first formed in the accretion disk of our Sun, it started a 700 million year long phase astronomers call the Grand Tack. Now, Tack is something a boat performs when going towards a buoy and then slipping past and around it. Then it speeds up and goes in the direction where it came from. That was the same thing Jupiter started doing. And in its tightening orbital migrations, the planet's gravity could have moved many asteroids and other space bodies, distorted the orbits of larger planets, and caused collisions and chaos. Jupiter's grand tack would have destroyed many big space bodies. It's a could-have-been scenario, but luckily, Jupiter changed its course and became a peaceful gas giant. Neptune, Uranus, and Saturn were starting their own version of this chaotic process. Saturn even got so big that its gravity started pulling Jupiter away from its orbit. But after some time, these gas giants' orbits became locked. Then both of them managed to clear away the gases remaining between them. And since these gases were some sort of fuel for the planet's migrations, Jupiter and Saturn could both finally settle into the stable orbits we know today. Jupiter can still lob one to two icy asteroids at the inner planets from time to time. But when our planet was younger, this could have been one of the processes that formed the oceans on Earth. But Jupiter is much calmer these days. Saturn's gravitational forces have moderated the situation and are now keeping it under control. Now, Jupiter is our protector. It's two and a half times the mass of the other planets of our solar system combined. It's some sort of a gravitational shield orbiting around the inner part of the solar system. Jupiter redirects incoming debris and asteroids away from the inner planets – Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars – keeping us all safe. Because of this, Earth has always been protected, so our planet has had enough time to evolve complex life forms. And it hasn't been destroyed by asteroids, hot Jupiters, or other space bodies. Jupiter wasn't the only planet that could have collided with Earth. Scientists think Mercury might have been involved in a hit-and-run accident with our planet. 
Mercury is the innermost planet in our solar system. It's the closest to the Sun and the smallest planet out there. And it also keeps getting smaller. Nowadays, its diameter is around 9 miles smaller compared to its size 4 billion years ago. Scientists think this might be happening because the planet's core is made of iron, and this iron is cooling and becoming solid, which is slowly reducing the planet's size. Mercury is the planet with the biggest number of craters in our solar system. Its atmosphere is really thin, so it can do nothing to keep the planet protected from meteors. The largest crater on Mercury's surface is at least 963 miles across. It could fit Western Europe, from Germany to Portugal. The object that formed such a crater must have been at least 62 miles long. With all these craters, Mercury looks similar to our Moon. It orbits the Sun faster than the other planets, so one year on Mercury lasts around 88 Earth days. That means celebrating a birthday every three months or even more often. At the same time, the planet rotates so slowly that a day on Mercury lasts almost 59 Earth days. A long time to wait to go to bed. There's a piece of Mercury on our planet. In 2012, a green meteorite was found at a street market in Morocco. Scientists studied its composition and concluded it could be from Mercury. Mercury doesn't have its own moons because of its small size and weak gravity. Plus, the planet is too close to the Sun. By the way, the only other planet without moons in our solar system is Venus. Mercury has a really thin crust, like a good pizza. <laughs> One of the theories of the planet's formation claims there was a major collision where the planet lost most of its crust. It could have also moved Mercury from its original spot. It wouldn't be unusual. The gas giants in our solar system also didn't form in the location where they are today. Mercury also has an eccentric orbit, which means it could have been kicked out of its old orbit and moved to a new one. Scientists also think Mercury might have collided with the early Earth. One theory says that's how the moon could be formed. Out of all the material flying away after the big crash, there might even have been pieces of Mercury's crust in the mix. Exoplanets Kepler-107b and Kepler-107c are a pair of planets that orbit a star similar to our Sun in the Kepler-107 system. It's around 1,700 light-years away from us. These planets have almost identical sizes, both with a radius 1.5 times that of Earth. But one of them, Kepler-107c, is almost three times as dense as the other. That's because the planets have a different composition. Some scientists believe that Kepler-107b is less dense because it probably collided with another unknown planet in the past. This powerful hit took away part of its surface and left behind a very dense core rich in iron. A huge comet hit Neptune around 200 years ago. But since Neptune isn't a rocky planet with a thin atmosphere, like Mars or Mercury, it's harder to find evidence of this impact. But a comet called Shoemaker-Levy 9 broke apart in 1994 and smashed into Jupiter. Astronomers managed to record this event. It helped them learn more about the elements and molecules the collisions left in Jupiter's atmosphere. This information helps scientists realize that the amount of carbon monoxide in the upper layers of Neptune's atmosphere is higher than in the lower ones. This means a big comet likely hit the planet in the past, since comets have carbon monoxide in their icy tails. Something huge slammed into Uranus, too, changing the planet forever. A space object twice bigger than Earth hit the ice giant. This left the planet tilted, and it looks as if it's rotating on its side. Uranus is extremely cold, way colder than it's supposed to be. It might mean that the object that slammed into it was probably a young protoplanet made up of ice and rocks. Also, some of the debris from that collision may have created a thin shell around Uranus. It still traps the heat coming from the core of the planet. There are strange energy pulses bombarding our entire galaxy, and they come from the other side of the universe. Over the last decade, scientists have been observing bizarre flashes of light coming toward our planet. This phenomenon is called fast radio bursts, or FRBs. These signals travel through a couple of billion light years of dust and gas. That's a rather long way. So far, no one has figured out what's going on behind these bursts. Bang! Another hit on Jupiter. Hmm, let's see. Gas giant, the largest planet in the solar system, 318 times bigger than the Earth, 
two and a half times bigger than the rest of the planets in the solar system put together. One more interesting thing. If it got any bigger, it would actually become smaller. You see, with more mass, the planet would be denser. That would cause Jupiter to start pulling in on itself. Scientists say Jupiter could have four times greater mass, but still keep the same size. It takes 10 hours to make a full rotation on its axis. It's the fastest spinning planet in our solar system and gets hit by so many space objects all the time. This was discovered by amateur astronomers observing Jupiter and saw some unusual flash at the planet's surface. Impact events cause flashes like that, and for some reason, Jupiter gets more impacts than other planets. In 1994, astronomers discovered Shoemaker-Levy 9, a comet that broke apart and collided with the gas giant. The original comet was approximately the size of one that erased the dinosaurs. However, this asteroid fell apart into more than 20 fragments. They darkened the planet's surface, and it remained like that for months. 15 years later, in 2009, astronomers saw a black spot on Jupiter the size of Earth. It was the result of an asteroid around 650 to 1650 feet in length. The biggest asteroid recorded on Earth hit the area of Tunguska, Russia in 1908. This caused a massive explosion, even though no one ever found a crater. So why is Jupiter the target for so many space objects? Asteroids and comets that pass by Earth and Jupiter go almost at the same speed. The number density of the space object that may interact is almost the same too. But the cross-section of what they might hit is very different. Jupiter has 11 times the diameter of our planet, which means it has around 125 times the cross-section. The more massive some planet is, the stronger its gravitational attraction. So it will entice some space objects drifting by. Our gravitational field is weaker than Jupiter's. If some object passes near us moving at a speed of 22,300 miles per hour or less, our gravitation will attract it. Asteroids and comets usually move at bigger speeds. Jupiter attracts most of the comets and asteroids passing by. If our planet was hit by such big objects as frequently as Jupiter, we'd have extinction like with dinosaurs thousands of times more often. In 2020, Scientists found there was an unusual asteroid in the orbit of Venus, the first one there. The size of a small mountain and rich in minerals we can find in Earth's deep rocks. They even think it could be a clue to a bigger set of asteroids created when our solar system was forming. That's not the only mystery around Venus. The planet has insanely violent winds that drive clouds and storms around the planet at speeds greater than 220 miles per hour. That's 60 times faster than Venus itself rotates. Also, scientists are still not sure what happened with its oceans. They believe since the planet is so close to the sun, the water evaporated and went into the atmosphere as steam. It trapped heat coming from the sun, heat that would have vaporized more and more water over time. Venus probably had an environment like on Earth, but a very long time ago. The theory says many comets and asteroids were slamming into Venus. Billions of the planet's pieces were flying all around. Some may have even crashed into Earth's moon. Pieces that slammed into our planet are probably buried very deep, since we have greater geological activity than the moon. Uranus also had a collision, but a more serious one than asteroids. The rest of the planets in our solar system mostly have an axis of rotation that kind of points up from the elliptical plane. Uranus is tilted, lying on the side. So a season there lasts 42 years, when either its south or the north pole is pointed at the sun. Most of the planets also rotate counterclockwise when you see them from above our solar system. Venus does the opposite, which means maybe it was kicked off axis a long time ago. Uranus may have collided with the other space body millions of years ago. When our solar system was still very young, the orbital configuration of Saturn and Jupiter may have crossed. Their gravitational forces kind of created orbital momentum and transferred it to Uranus. That knocked it off axis. Millions of asteroids orbit the Sun, and not so many pass by Earth from time to time, so we don't have some dangerous space bodies coming toward us. The plan is to visit Mars in the 2030s, and scientists hope Mars won't be a target of some bigger space bodies. New craters are formed on the red planet every one to two days. They can be 13 feet across, which means they could have been formed by objects that are the size of a soccer ball. Since the atmosphere there is thinner than ours, smaller bodies can enter easier. Most of the Martian north is smooth lowlands. 
The South is higher, full of craters, and the planet's interior has a surprising amount of rare metals. The theory says this is because a big celestial body collided with Mars and tore away a part of its northern half. Debris from that asteroid circled the planet and then mixed into two small moons that orbit Mars. We also have some Mars rocks on Earth, found in the Sahara Desert, Antarctica, and some other places across the globe. Some of these rocks have gas that's chemically the same as the atmosphere on Mars. Rocks probably came due to a big explosion that happened when some larger asteroid or meteor that was ejected from Mars and landed on our planet. Mercury also has a thin atmosphere, so there are many smaller strikes there. Imagine waking up, going to your window, and see there are micrometeor showers every morning, which is something that happens on Mercury. This strange weather pattern shapes its atmosphere, called an exosphere. Mercury is so dense, its heavy iron core accounts for two-thirds of its total mass. Scientists think it could have been bigger in the past, but many collisions got the surface sort of scraped off. It's been constantly bombarded by rocks from space that left marks with craters. Planes on its surface seem to have been created because of volcanic lava spilling over the surface and then dried smooth. Many craters are filled with such a material, which means there's one more thing that rocked Mercury's world – volcanoes. There's an unusual group of asteroids discovered near Neptune – wide range in sizes from big metropolitan areas to tiny pebbles. They are thought to come from an asteroid group called the Kuiper Belt. It makes a ring well beyond Neptune. But these new asteroids have different colors than the Kuiper Belt. They're so far away from the Sun, their surface was supposed to stay almost pristine. But they have a similar color to those sun-baked asteroids around Jupiter. Like the rest of the planets, Neptune gets heat from the Sun. But there's something mysterious inside the planet that makes it generate more heat than it gets. This affects its weather, and Neptune has the weirdest weather in the whole solar system. Massive storms, insanely high winds, cirrus-like clouds that rapidly change all the time. There are dark spots in its atmosphere. They come and go. We receive a thousand times more sunlight than Neptune. Gas giants like Saturn and Jupiter can protect our planet from asteroids. Without them, the big impacts that created enough debris to form both moons and other planets would happen more often. There's a huge asteroid going around Saturn, which could be a potential flyby by 2031, more than 10 times bigger than the asteroid that erased the dinosaurs. Titan, one of the moons orbiting Saturn, 80% more massive than our moon, is actually the only moon in our solar system that has an atmosphere. It's one and a half times thicker than ours and consists mainly of nitrogen, like our atmosphere. No one knows where all that nitrogen came from. However, unlike Saturn and most of the other places in our solar system, its moon has a real potential to host life. Is it possible for a planet to have not one, not two, but many suns? Let's imagine what would happen to us if the sun suddenly decided to break into a bunch of small stars. During the search for Earth-like planets throughout the universe, Scientists have discovered that systems of two or even three stars are not actually that rare. Many of them even have planets in their habitable zones. Almost half of these planets could contain life. Can't wait to ask these guys about the sunsets. Scientists even suggest that our sun wasn't always lonely. It could have had a companion star called Nemesis. They've noticed that mass extinctions on Earth occur every 27 million years. It's like a cycle. So they turned to the stars to find out what the reason might be. And then they assumed that it was a star that left our sun a long time ago. But it still affects us. Nemesis could be located about 1.5 light years from us. It may not sound like a lot, but it's actually almost 9 trillion miles. That's going to be a fun car trip. 50 million years long. Anyway, every time Nemesis passes its orbit, it can affect the Oort cloud. The Oort cloud is an area surrounding our solar system in which comets are formed. Its existence hasn't yet been proven, but scientists are pretty sure about it. So, comets form inside this cloud and then relocate to our solar system. Even being very far away, the second star in the system can have a great influence on it. But what about systems with four or even more stars? Is it even possible? 
Actually, yeah. But the more celestial bodies you add to the system, the more difficult it becomes. The orbits grow unstable. It's going to be as chaotic as can be. In stellar mechanics, it's called the three-body problem. It says that it's very difficult to predict the orbits of bodies in such systems. In most cases, they turn out to be very random and unique. Isaac Newton was the first to have noticed it. He tried to apply his gravitational discoveries to the Earth, the Moon, and the Sun. He found himself with quite a struggle. It wasn't easy to understand how three stellar objects orbit so stably around each other. And that's just a planet and a satellite. How about including several stars? I wouldn't envy those who will have to calculate all this. Oh, right, it's me. Anyway, we know that triple star systems are ridiculously chaotic. But what about systems with more stars? They're very, very rare. In 2021, NASA discovered a star system of as many as six stars. That's just crazy. Of course, there are no planets in it, but who knows? Maybe one day we'll find such a system, too. In such worlds, the gravity dance is very complex. It takes very specific conditions to hold everything together. It's like walking on a tightrope over an abyss. With all this in mind, let's try to imagine what would happen if the sun suddenly turned into several small stars. <laughs> oh, we're going to need a very detailed simulation. No, probably even a dozen simulations to make this thing work. Because otherwise, we'd only have a few options. Option 1. We divide the sun into 5 to 10 tiny suns. Now we'll scatter these guys not far from each other. They'll destroy our system in a couple of hours. Yeah. All star systems, including ours, are in constant motion across the universe. So, they'll crash into each other almost immediately. This collision will lead to the creation of a supernova. Our system will turn into a beautiful, colorful nebula. For us, it will happen in just a couple of minutes. We won't even have time to feel anything. And all the planets in the X solar system will immediately turn into sparkling space dust. Um, but it's not the best option for us, right? Let's see if it can go any other way. Option 2. Since they can't be located so close to each other, let's try to set them as far away as possible. And in this case, they'll just leave. Buh bye Their gravitational force is too weak to hold everything together. The little suns will simply leave the solar system, flying into space in random directions. After that, the rest of the planets will descend from their orbits, including poor little us, of course. We'll become a so-called rogue planet. At first, we won't even realize that the planet has gone out of orbit, and we won't have time to do anything before it gets incredibly cold. What a sad and poetic end. In general, none of these outcomes sounds very fun. Oh, all right, we still have the last option. Our main problem is that we make each of these little stars the same mass. But just take a look at all these multi-star systems that we've already discovered. You'll see that none of them look like a bunch of glowing balls together. Instead, there are a couple of large stars there, and the rest, the small ones, are orbiting around them. So how about two large stars and two small ones? What will the Earth look like then? Well, its orbit will become terribly unstable. We'll shake back and forth. Wouldn't recommend it, honestly. We know what this can lead to because, and that's just crazy, this has already happened to us once. Yes, about 70,000 years ago, a lone star visited our solar system. It was a red dwarf called Scholz. A red dwarf is a very small and cold star. If you count 14,000 degrees Fahrenheit as cold, of course, but it's considered the weakest and coldest type of star so it probably didn't look that big and bright in the sky. At that time, our ancestors, Homo sapiens, were already there living their lives. And can you imagine? They saw another star in the sky approaching the sun. I wonder what that looked like. And then, Scholz bypassed the sun and flew somewhere further to surf space. You weren't expecting some kind of disaster, were you? If it had happened, you wouldn't have had a chance to watch this video right now. But from this story, we can see what happens to the Earth during such stellar events. At that time, a huge amount of volcanic activity unfolded on our planet. 
We also got some meteor showers that almost wiped us out. Our ancestors sure had it rough. Something similar will happen on our hypothetical planet with four suns, but on a much greater scale. Constant volcanic activity, earthquakes, and tsunamis. Brr. In addition, the length of a day will change, as well as the length of all seasons, and a year as a whole. They won't be stable anymore due to the regular changes in gravitation. In other words, you'll never know when to expect an annual winter or hot summer. And when we are precisely in the middle between two stars, there won't be any nights at all. They'll illuminate both parts of our planet, and we'll have to sleep in bright sunlight. And if you think this is a bad thing, keep in mind that we'll also be attacked by much more ultraviolet rays and solar winds because of our four suns. Their color will also change. They'll become red dwarfs, looking distinctly orange scarlet in the sky. We'll also get many more solar eclipses, except instead of the moon, the sun would be eclipsed by another sun. It would probably just get a little darker. To be honest, it's unlikely that anything would survive on Earth after all this. I mean, it is possible, but please run a hundred simulations yourself if you want to make sure. But theoretically, we could survive in a simple binary star system. For example, in one that consists of two stars close to each other. Each of them would have to be two times smaller than our sun. That would be the perfect scenario. And it's quite possible in the future. NASA is currently working on a plan to relocate our descendants to Proxima Centauri b. That's a planet near the closest star system to our sun, Alpha Centauri. And who knows, maybe one day in the future, we'll really move there. Then we'll see what it's like to live with several suns. There's only one star in our solar system, the sun. And all the planets orbit this star. But there are also systems where a planet orbits two suns. For example, Kepler-16b. It's an inhospitable and cold place made of half rock, half gas. But the coolest thing there is that if you visited this planet, you'd see two sunsets and have two shadows. But astronomers seem to have found something rarer and more bizarre. There might be a planet that orbits three stars at once. The GW Orionis star system is around 1,300 light years away from our planet. It's composed of three orange rings. They're made of dust and nested inside one another. In the center of this system, you can see three stars. Two of these stars are binary. It means they orbit each other. The third star revolves around them. Scientists have found out that the three rings are misaligned. The innermost ring swings widely in its orbit, and the outermost ring has a tilt of 38 degrees. So, astronomers came up with two theories. The first theory says the break in these rings occurred because three suns created torque at the center of the entire system. Torque is a gravitational force that always acts toward the center. But sometime later, this theory was written off. There wasn't enough turbulence in these rings for this theory to work. The second theory claimed that this phenomenon could be happening because a planet formed inside one of these rings. A young planet could affect the gravitational balance of the three ring system and be the reason they were spread so far apart. There's a specific gap in the dust cloud. Based on its size, the planet we're talking about must be a large gas giant the size of our Jupiter. All space objects have been formed thanks to gravity pulling matter together. If there's even the slightest rotation at the beginning, the spin rate increases with time, especially when an object starts collapsing. That's why all space objects rotate, including dust particles and even black holes. Black holes lose their mass because of a thing called Hawking radiation. Their event horizons are becoming smaller, but this process is very, very slow. A black hole's event horizon is a point of no return. It's like a boundary that surrounds a black hole. And nothing, including light and radiation, can escape once it crosses this boundary. The average black hole would need billions of times the age of our universe to disappear completely. Our home Milky Way galaxy might also contain a supermassive black hole, but we're in no danger. One of the closest large black holes, V4647 Sagittarii, is most likely 20,000 light-years away. It's safe to observe the effects black holes create from a distance. 
problems start when you get too close because of their mind-boggling gravitational force. Galaxies can consume one another, which is one of the ways how they evolve over time. Our closest neighbor is called Andromeda, and it's currently munching on one of its satellite galaxies. In the past, Andromeda ate at least two others. Plenty of star clusters are scattered all over this galaxy. Andromeda must have stolen these stars from other galaxies. Scientists have finally managed to identify those stars. They have tracked them back to galaxy mergers that happened billions of years ago. 10 billion years ago, our home galaxy also went through a collision. That's why now, its halo isn't like the ones other spiral galaxies have. Scientists first thought it was several small collisions, but then they realized that most of these space objects in the Milky Way came from a single source. It was another galaxy, Enceladus, that the Milky Way collided with. The Milky Way and Andromeda galaxy might collide, but it's unlikely to happen in the next 4.5 billion years. Neutrinos are electrically neutral particles that are so powerful that they can go through miles and miles of lead, and nothing will stop them. Some of them are passing through your body as you're watching this. Neutrinos get formed both in the nuclear reactions inside alive stars and in the supernova explosions when stars go out. These particles are nearly massless. They need less than three seconds to get to the surface of the sun. And then they can reach our planet in only eight minutes. There's a planet, TOI-1231b, around 90 light years away from Earth. It's similar to our Neptune. It's a gas giant, but the most interesting thing is that this planet is likely to be rich in atmosphere. The planet is over three and a half times as large as Earth and a bit warmer than we're used to, 134 degrees Fahrenheit. It orbits a red dwarf star way smaller than our sun. But this star is also much older. One year on the planet is only 24 Earth days long. Even though the planet is close to its parent star, it remains relatively cold. That's because its star is on the cooler side too. Astronomers think they've seen clouds in the atmosphere of this mysterious planet. And maybe they're even made of water. This star and planet system is moving away from Earth pretty fast. That's why scientists easily detected hydrogen atoms that were escaping from the planet's atmosphere. Yep, that means the planet may even have a tail. A hypothetical white hole is a bizarre space object that is the opposite of a black hole. It's intensely bright and was first mentioned by Einstein in his theory of gravity. Most often, scientists talk about white holes in the context of wormholes. There's a theory that a black hole is like some sort of entry point to a tunnel that takes you through space and time. In this case, a white hole might be an exit located somewhere else in the universe. On the other hand, white holes don't necessarily need to be exits from wormholes. They could also be a slow motion replay of how original black holes were formed. So the formation of a black hole starts with an old massive star. After it collapses under its own weight, it usually turns into a black hole. But sometimes, quantum processes don't turn a star into a black hole. Instead, they make a white hole that starts spewing out the matter of the original star again. But so far, this is just a theory. Some planets like Mars and Venus have pretty intense weather with powerful storms. And now, an equally strong space hurricane might have come to Earth. It was a swirling mass of air about 620 miles wide. Satellites spotted the hurricane hundreds of miles above the North Pole, somewhere in the Earth's upper atmosphere. The hurricane was raining not water, but electrons. It lasted almost eight hours before it finally broke down. It was spinning in a counterclockwise direction. It's possible there are oceans hidden under the surface of the moons surrounding Uranus. Scientists have also been investigating the oceans on Jupiter's moon Europa and Saturn's moon Enceladus. These oceans are hidden below the moon's icy crusts. Uranus has 27 moons. Five of them are especially big. Those are Umbriel, Titania, Oberon, Miranda, and Ariel. Back in the 1980s, when people sent Voyager 2 to get us some images of these five moons, scientists found out that they had lots of craters and were made up of ice and rock. Pictures astronomers got then also showed signs of liquid water. It was erupting from the moon's depths and freezing on the surface. 
one of the most plausible explanations was the oceans under the surface. As a moon moves around a planet, the magnetic field of that planet tugs at it. That is how the moon stays in its orbit. This tug generates an electrical current that transforms into a magnetic field. Such a magnetic field is called induced, and subsurface oceans might be the reason why this induced field can be produced. Saturn is well known for its famous rings, but Neptune, Uranus, and Jupiter also have rings. At the same time, Saturn has something really special we've never seen on any other planet. It's this huge hexagon storm moving around the planet's north pole. Each of its sides is almost 7,500 miles long. That's an area so great, we could place almost four Earths inside. According to thermal images, this hexagonal cloud pattern goes down into Saturn's atmosphere for around 60 miles. The planet is hiding behind thick clouds, and sunlight can't get through them. That's why astronomers can't see what exactly is going on there. But there are theories. Saturn is a gas giant. When gas deep inside the planet gets heated, it strays further out. Huge amounts of energy are released along with that gas, which makes it rise, expand, and lose density. The same processes cause hurricanes and tornadoes on our planet. On Saturn, whirling gases come out of a high pressure zone located within Saturn's outer layers, and these gases trigger a powerful storm of such an unusual shape. Two bright beams of sunlight are traveling across your forehead, cheeks, eyes. Ooh, you scrunch up your face and sneeze loudly. It would be nothing unusual if the sun's rays weren't coming from two different stars. Yep, you're still on Earth, but this Earth has two suns. What would your life look like in such a world? It'd depend on the star's mass and their positions relative to Earth and each other. If the stars were small, their gravity wouldn't be enough to keep our planet in its orbit. It'd eventually drift away into space. But if one of the stars was larger than the other, it would have a much stronger gravitational pull. And sooner or later, Earth would end up too close to it. It'd become too hot to live on the planet. You know, boiling oceans, evaporating rivers and glaciers, and scorching hot air. Lovely. In the end, our once blue world would crash into the star and, you know, disappear. The only chance for Earth to have a stable orbit would be to move around only one of the two suns. But it wouldn't be that great for all kinds of life forms on the planet. Every once in a while, the two stars would face both sides of Earth. It would mean there would be no nights. Our planet would get twice as much heat as usual. It'd also be bombarded with double doses of radiation. And of course, solar winds would become twice stronger. During such periods, you'd have to hide indoors and probably order drone delivery. Because you set your foot outside, the two suns would get you toasted in no time, what with all that heat and solar radiation. Uh-oh, it doesn't sound optimistic. Maybe it would be better if our planet was moving around both stars. Eh, perhaps. Its orbit would be rather unstable in this case. And still, it would be better than experiencing crazy heat waves every now and then. But in this situation, the stars would have to be close to each other, and Earth would most likely travel too far away to get enough heat to keep its water liquid. If our planet had been developing in such conditions from the very beginning, now it would be just a frozen rock with no life on it. How about the most optimistic scenario? Our planet would get itself two similar-sized stars, and each of them would be more than half as powerful and bright as our current sun. By the way, it sounds rather realistic. Such equal mass double stars do exist. Their common gravitational pull would be just enough for Earth to not fly out into space. And the amount of energy our planet would get would be more or less the same as it receives now. But the combined mass of the stars would be about one and a half times the mass of our current sun. It would mean their gravity would also be stronger. And one year on the planet would be shorter. It lasts not 365, but around 280 days. But Earth would only feel comfortable if it was at least four times farther from its stars than they were from each other. Then our planet would happily move around their common center of mass. In other words, the suns would have to be less than 10 million miles apart. Then the rest of the planets in the solar system, including Mercury, would have stable orbits. If you lived on the Earth that was moving around two stars, 
you'd be able to watch awesome solar eclipses. But it would not be the moon blocking the sun, but one of the stars preventing you from seeing the other. Instead of several minutes, eclipses would last for hours on end. They would also occur much more often, maybe once in a week or so. If the stars were a bit larger in size, there would be two types of eclipses. Every now and then, a smaller star would block the larger one, but only partially. But when the bigger star blocked the smaller, it would result in a total solar eclipse, complete darkness. Two suns would mean days would become brighter. Nights, sunrises, sunsets, these would change too. The star would set and rise at different times. So arriving too late to watch the sunset? It wouldn't be a problem. You'd still be in time for the second one. With two suns, the seasons on Earth might also start to change more rapidly. They would be harsher than now. Most life forms on the planet would be struggling to keep up with intense and fast climate changes. But returning to the combined gravity that would be stronger than what we have now, because of this, everything on the planet's surface would look different. Trees would be thick and short, plants stiff and tough, animals would be way bigger and sturdier, their legs would be more massive to support their weight, it would increase due to the stronger gravity. People would most likely be bulky and short. Their bones would be thicker, either to withstand higher gravity or because of constant breaking and healing. Humans would also have stronger muscles, lungs, and hearts. Well, at least, the gravity wouldn't double at once. If it happened, our planet's core would probably collapse on itself right away. Then it would release so much heat, it would burn everything on the surface. Like us. Even if the gravity was increasing gradually, adapting to this new world would still be a challenge. Buildings and bridges would collapse under their new weight. Planes wouldn't be able to fly. In any case, discussing what Earth would look like with two suns is nothing but a guessing game at the moment. But scientists know for sure that such planets do exist. Kepler-16b was discovered by the Kepler Space Telescope. The planet, the only one astronomers know about so far, orbits two stars. It has beautiful double sunsets and is around 200 light-years away from Earth. But this planet isn't a welcoming one. It's the size of Saturn and extremely cold. Kepler-16b is mostly made of gas. It might have a rocky core, but astronomers aren't so sure about that. The planet is also out of its star's habitable zone. That's the area where there might be liquid water. Plus, the stars are colder than our sun and much smaller. One of them is less than 70% of our sun's mass, and the other just 20%. That's why scientists are almost sure no life could survive in such a place. It's highly unlikely Earth could be developing in the same way, even if it was orbiting two stars. After all, our planet isn't a gas giant like Kepler-16b. But if this had somehow happened, Earth's fate would be very different now. The temperatures on the planet's surface would be lower than minus 100 degrees Fahrenheit. All water would be frozen. And the chances are Earth would never have turned into the blooming green paradise we live in. At the same time, our sun might have had a companion long, long ago. It could be Nemesis, a theoretical dwarf star. If it had been a white dwarf, just a teaspoon of its matter would have weighed more than 5 tons. It's almost as heavy as an elephant. White dwarfs are extremely dense. They can be the size of our planet, but as massive as our sun. Such a dwarf star could be responsible for several mass extinctions on Earth. Scientists think it could somehow affect objects in the outer solar system. It's the region which is home to giant planets. Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, and their moons. Anyway, Nemesis could push different space bodies off their course. Then it probably hurtled them toward Earth, where they collided with our planet and caused terrible disasters. It's just a theory, though. Many scientists don't support it, and astronomers haven't found any evidence yet. But a 2017 study suggested such a star could exist in the ancient past. Even better, the researchers claimed each star, like our sun, was once born with a companion. But even if Nemesis had existed all those billions of years ago, it would have broken free of the sun's gravity quite early in its history. And then it would have wandered off into the Milky Way.